Suspense. Tonight's Suspense brings you our star, Mr. Dennis O'Keefe. But first, do you know that... On the great ship Queen Elizabeth, where travel is the last word in luxury, the first name in wines is... C-R-E-S-T-A? B-L-A-N-C-A. Cresta? Blanca. Cresta Blanca. Yes, the best serve Cresta Blanca California wines from the finest of the vines. And whatever the occasion, there's a magnificent Cresta Blanca selection to bring rare pleasure to the most discriminating taste. So, distinguish your diners. Pour Cresta Blanca Burgundy, Cresta Blanca Sauterne, or any Cresta Blanca table wine, and enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring Dennis O'Keefe in the X-Ray Camera. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. I've been reading a lot here, and I came across something good the other day. There is a shadowy borderland between hate and love, and there are men who dwell in this land of mixed emotions, loving deeply and fiercely, and yet the same time, hating venomously and murderously. I guess I both loved and hated my wife. I was crazy for her, lonely and desperate without her. At the same time, I wish she'd be killed or die somehow so I wouldn't keep depending on her for the affection I'm always so hungry for. This is Johnny. Oh. What do you want? I told you not to bother. Well, now, listen, Anna. I've I've got to see you. I don't want to see you, Johnny. If I told you once, I told you a hundred times, don't fall. Yes, I know. But now, wait. This is important. I must talk to you, Anna. Just let me talk to you. Oh, Johnny, listen. Now, listen, please. Let me see you for just a few minutes. Saturday night. After that, if you still want me to stay away, I will. I'll never bother you again. That's what you always say. Oh, listen, honey. Won't you just let me talk to you? If it's no go, I'll let you have that divorce. All I want is ten minutes, that's all. You on the level? About the divorce? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, Johnny. Come over at seven o'clock Saturday. But I might as well tell you now, you're wasting your time. Oh, you why can't you be reasonable about it, Anna? You know, you Save and I your could... breath, Johnny. You want to see me? All right, all right, I'll see you. Seven o'clock Saturday. Goodbye. <laughs> it didn't look good. I could feel that all the things I'd saved up to say to her wouldn't work. She hated me, and she'd never have me back again. There's a stubborn streak in me that wouldn't let me give it up. I figured I'd play it as I'd planned it. Then if she wouldn't change her mind, I'd go through with it to the end. Late Saturday afternoon, I went down to Hooper's department store and sauntered over to the jewelry counter... Yes, sir? I'd like to see a wristwatch. Ladies' wristwatch, please. How much would you like to spend? Oh, I don't know. About uh, 200 or so. Oh, well, here you are. 17 jewel movement, 14 carat white gold case set with 10 small diamonds. Very pretty. And it's reduced from 349 to 225. Say, that's pretty classy. <laughs> Some girl's going to get a mighty nice surprise. Huh? You like it? I like it. I love it. I wish I had a friend who could buy things like that for me. Oh, now you're kidding me. A beautiful girl like you must have plenty of friends. Oh, not anyone I could really call a friend. I see. Uh, this watch. How would you like it if I gave this to you? Just like that, huh? Well, not exactly just like that. First, I'd have to get to know you better. <sighs> not from that side of the county. No, but you could meet me after you get through with work. I don't leave here till nine. Okay. I could wait until nine. For you. On the 34th Street side. It'll take me about ten minutes to change my clothes. I'll be there. It's a date. Even if you don't buy the watch. Oh, I told you I am buying it. Well, I have to make out a sales slip. Name, please. Hmm? 
Oh, uh, James Landry. Yeah, yeah, James Landry. What's yours? Joyce. See, that'll be two twenty-five plus tax of twenty percent, making it two seventy, and uh, sales tax is four fifty. Two seventy four fifty, all told. Your address, please. Oh, you don't need that. It is uh, two hundred and seventy and four and uh, fifty cents. Right. Right. Shall I wrap it? I don't know, just like that. Ten after nine, baby, huh? I'll be there. <laughs> Yes, the chances were I would be there. I didn't hold out much hope that Anna would listen to me. And if she didn't, well, why not? Joyce girl was quite a kid. Tall, slim, terrific guy, pleasant smile. Sure, why not? And besides, she'd work right in with the whole thing. She'd work in swell. I had plenty of time before seven in my appointment with my wife, so I wandered through the shop. Even bought myself a new robe. After all, you might want to impress someone. I had the robe sent home, and then I dropped into Patty's clam house. When I finished coffee, it was time to take the BMT to Anna's. I got there just at seven. It was a little awkward at first, but after a while, I got to it. Oh, I tell you, Anna, this last year's just been awful. Oh, you know, I'm still crazy about you, and every hour we're apart just makes me feel worse. Is that all you have to say, Johnny? No, no, no. Let me finish. I admit I've been a heel. I've, well, I've done everything wrong. You were perfectly right to leave me. All I can say is I'm sorry, and then it won't happen again. Oh, sure. No, Anna, really. I'll turn over a new leaf. You take me back, and you'll see. I promise you'll never have any reason to complain. Johnny, you know it'll never work out. Oh, but it will. You've given me your word dozens of times, and always it's the same. I, I, I just can't take that sort of thing anymore. I but can't. I can't be happy living alone like this in a furnished room, eating out. I still have the apartment. If you come back, you don't have to work either. I've got a swell job now. I'm head mechanic at a big garage. Oh, but things can be a lot better than before. We'll have more money. Johnny, I'm not thinking of the money. I make enough to get by. Then why not try? I just want my peace of mind, oh, but Johnny. Anna. It hasn't been so bad this last year. At least I don't have to be worrying about where you are nights. If you want to chase the girls, oh, it's no, not my wait concern a minute. anymore. Not... No, if we get together again, I'll have it all over again. Sitting up and wondering and hating it and hating oh. you and hating myself. No, no, Johnny. No, not anymore. Oh, but there won't be any more of that. I swear no, it. No, not until the next time. Oh, yeah. gee, Anna. Why don't you believe me? Oh. oh, I know I lied about it before, but not this time. It means too much to me this time. I've got to have you back. Look. Look, honey, I brought you something. Just to show you I do mean it. A watch. Very nice. Well, put it on, Anna. Go ahead. Wear it. That won't do, Johnny. That isn't enough. It's not nearly enough to convince me you're really any different. What more can I say? Nothing, nothing. Just forget it, Johnny. Just let me get a divorce and forget all about it. You, you, you'll you, find someone else. Is that why you want a divorce? So you can find someone else? Well, there isn't anyone just now, but I don't see why there shouldn't well, be. Well, I won't do it. I'll never give you a divorce. Uh... You're my wife, and you're going to stay my wife. Like the preacher said, till death do his part. Well, the preacher was wrong, Johnny. I'm saving my money. When I have enough, I'll get it. You can't keep me tied to you all my There's life. There's only one thing that'll break up our marriage, and that's you are dying. You better go, Johnny. I don't like this kind of talk. Well, I'm warning you, Anna. If you don't come back, I'll... I'll kill you. Oh, Johnny, you're bluffing. You can't kill a fly, oh, not I'm bluffing, you. Huh? You're too scared. And besides, the first one the cops would look for would be you. They know all about your threats, yeah. Johnny. You don't scare me. Any more than you ever did. Now, oh, you better go, please. But this time, I'm not bluffing. Wait a minute. Here's your watch, Johnny. Take it back to the store and get your money. Give it to that little redhead. You're still seeing her, aren't you, Johnny? Oh, you think I'm bluffing, huh? Well, you'll see. You'll see if I'm bluffing or not. You know, Mr. Landry, I was sure you wouldn't show up at 9 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> what made you think that? Well, I thought you were giving me a line. Anyone who buys a watch like that must have a girl. Well, I still have it in my pocket. Gosh, then you weren't kidding. Why should I kid you, sister? You're too pretty to kid. But you can't mean you're going to give it to me. Sure. Why not? If I feel like it. What business are you in? You're not a, a racketeer, are you? <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm on the other side of the fence. What do you mean? I'm a private eye. A private eye? 
Oh, gosh, this is thrilling. Imagine me knowing a real detective. <laughs> well, just keep it under your hat. It, it doesn't do for people to know my business, you know. Makes it harder to tailor crook. Oh, you must have so many exciting things happening to you. No, it's all in the day's work. Are you working on a case now? Are you, are you, are you trying to solve a murder? No. I'm trying to get the goods on a jewel thief. Really? Yeah. This gal, uh, she works for a big diamond-cutting firm. The firm hired me. And she's been stealing diamonds? We think so. Well, then why don't you arrest her? My goodness, if someone is stealing diamonds... Well, you just... can't just haul her in. You've got to get the goods on her first. Well, I should think that would be easy. To search her. Mm. We arrest her and find nothing, and we can get sued for false arrest. Even if she's a crook? True, true. You've got to have the proof first. And I'm out to get it. But how? Can I trust you not to talk? Why, Mr. Landry, you know you can't. Jim... Oh, sure, Jim. But tell me about it. Well, you see, there are a lot of things in detective work that crooks don't know about. Mm -hmm. For example, and this is a secret, remember, we have an X-ray camera. An X-ray camera? What for? Well, suppose we want to see if someone has something hidden in his clothes, you know, a gun or something. Oh, my goodness. Take a picture with this X-ray camera, we know. And then you can use that camera to tell if this woman has the stolen diamonds on her, huh? Sure. Sure, only I, uh, I can't do it. Why not? I can't get close enough to her. She knows me. Every time she sees me, she ducks. Oh. You see, you've got to stand real close with that camera, else it doesn't register. Well, then why don't you hire someone to take the picture? Someone she doesn't know. You can't trust anybody. This camera is so secret that you can't let a stranger handle it. Well, get someone you can't trust. <laughs> what am I going to do? Advertise in the papers for someone I can trust? How would I know I can trust anyone who answered the ad? You could trust me. I could do it for you. Oh, yes, yes, but I wouldn't ask you to. It's dangerous work. If a gang ever found out, they might rub you out. Would they have to find out? I, I, I could just slip up behind her and take the picture and nobody would know. And that's because they saw the camera. Well, I wouldn't have to see it. I, I could hide it in a box or something. There you are. I could do it. Oh, but you have a job. I'll take a day off. Hey, you know, that's mighty nice of you. <laughs> you know, it would mean quite a lot to me. Oh, I, I'd love to do it. Well, I'd get a big fee if I could get the goods on her. And, of course, I'd pay you for your time. Oh, you wouldn't have to pay me. I'd do it just for friendship. Okay, then. Okay, it's a deal. And just to show you how I feel about it here, wrap this around your wrist. The watch? Oh, Jimmy, you don't have to give it to me. Take it, honey. I want you to. Well, anything you say, Jimmy. You're the boss. The next day I brought home a short piece of three-inch pipe and a cheese box I picked up in the alley and I set to work I got the grenade out It was a grenade that my cousin Ed gave me when he came back I used to show it around and say it was a war souvenir I'd picked up in Berlin although I never got near Germany In no time at all I had everything assembled and I got some wrapping paper, the paper my robe came wrapped in from Hooper's. It was a good double thickness, and I made a neat package of it, tying it securely with string. Through a tiny hole in one end, I left the cord attached to the firing pin, stick out of the box. It would be kind of tough on Joyce. When that cord was pulled, something was going to happen. And I didn't be, want to be around when it did. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Mr. Dennis O'Keefe in the X-Ray Camera. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, better tasting Roma Wines, from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This is the season when the grunt of the pigskin is heard on gridirons from coast to coast. And that's the signal for friendly get-togethers after the big game. Well, here's a timely suggestion on how to have fun, yet do it inexpensively. Serve guests delicious Roma California wine. To add warmth to your welcome, serve glorious nut-like Roma sherry or hearty red Roma port. And especially if the home team wins... What better way to celebrate than with bubbling Roma champagne, a sprightly, dry bulk, processed sparkling wine? Yes, there's a Roma wine to delight every taste, on every occasion. 
So buy Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines tomorrow. Discover for yourself why Roma Wines are America's largest selling wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Dennis O'Keefe as John Lawrence, with Kathy Lewis as his wife Anna, and Lorene Tuttle as Joyce in the X-Ray Camera, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. Hi. Hi, hop in, Joyce. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, I'm so excited. You mean the camera? Oh, no, not this time, kid. We don't work that fast. But I took the afternoon off, especially. Yes, yes, I know you did. But first, we have to do some groundwork. Oh. Later, when we take the picture, you'll have to take another afternoon off. All right, I can do that. What do we do today? Well, I'm going to park the car on the street near this diamond cutting firm. It's down here on Fulton Street. We'll sit in the car until she comes out. Oh, then you'll, uh, you'll put, put the finger on her. <laughs> That's one way of saying it. You see, I don't want her to see us together. Give her ideas. Oh, I know that. She walks up the street to the BMT. You follow her. You mean I I, I tailor? That sounds more professional. Uh-huh. Yeah. You tailor. Stick close by just as if you had the camera. Here, uh, take this dummy package I made up for you. What's in this? Nothing. It's just a box wrapped in paper. The camera's real heavy, but this is just for practice. I see. When you get into the subway, you stand right next to her. Well, suppose she gets a seat. Not at five o'clock, she won't. You just make sure you're right behind her. Oh, I'll stick to her, all right. Don't you worry about that. And then you hold the camera like this, the long way, see? Mm -hmm. Try to hold it steady and pull on this cord I have attached to the inside. What's that for? Well, it uh, it trips the shutter on the camera in the box. You see, the camera's all wrapped up, so in order to get at the shutter, I had to tie a cord to it. Oh, I see. Will the camera take a picture from inside the box? It's an X-ray camera, isn't it? Oh, yes. Of course, I forgot. And it'll take about 15 seconds for the exposure to be made. You better wait till you're going through the tunnel to Brooklyn before you take the picture. That way, you'll be sure people won't be shoving you, you know, getting in and out of the train. I understand. Then I'll meet you in Brooklyn. You get off at Court Street, and I'll meet you in the St. George Hotel lobby. It's very simple. All you've got to remember is to hold the camera still during the 15 seconds it takes to expose the film. Oh, of course. I'll, I'll hold it right between us. That's a girl. You're real smart. What time is it? Um, it's just five after five now by my very favorite watch, which a bow of mine gave me. Mm-hmm. And there she comes out of that door. You see her? She's walking up the street. The girl in the blue hat. Oh, I see her. Go on. Go on, get on her tail. I'll see you in Brooklyn later. Well, leave it to me, Jim. This rehearsal is going to go just perfect. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye, honey. <laughs> I watched her as she hurried up the street after Anna. I almost regretted that I hadn't given her the real package. But it was better this way. If there were any chinks in the plan, this rehearsal would show them up. I drove over to the bridge and across the river to Brooklyn. She was waiting in the St. George lobby. Ah, how did it go? Well... I could have held it still for two minutes instead of 15 seconds. She was pushed into a corner right in front of me. No hitches? No, nothing. She didn't even complain at the box pushing in her back. Mm -hmm. She's awfully pretty, Jim. Why should a pretty girl like that be mixed up in stealing diamonds? Some people will do anything for money. You know how much she got away with in the last couple of months? A lot? More than $100,000. Wow. Oh, now I see. Will you get much of a reward? Five grand, maybe ten. A good slice of that will be yours. Oh, Jim, I don't care about the money. I'm doing this for you. I know, kid. And don't think I don't appreciate it. Now, uh, about the real job. You think you can get off in the store at four on Friday? Four o'clock it is. Great, great. A little after five, someone will be in for a mighty big surprise. So Friday, I picked her up in front of the store and drove over to the subway. I kissed her, and then I gave her the camera. Is that it? Yeah. Now, be careful of it now. Don't drop it or anything. It's, uh, it's awfully expensive. One of its kind in this country. Gee, it's heavy. Oh, sure, sure it is. It's got batteries in there, an x-ray tube. It's, it's very complicated. It looks just like one of the packages from the store. Yeah, I know. I got it up to look that way so it wouldn't be suspicious. She mustn't know you're carrying a camera. Oh, don't you worry. Nobody would know that. 
Is this the cord I pulled? Hey, be careful, don't. Don't, don't fool around with that. Well, I wasn't going to pull it now. Well, I, I just don't want the plate exposed, but when you do pull, pull it all the way. Hard. Give it a real yank. Why do that? You leave it to me. And remember, the cord is at the back, and you point the front right at her middle. She carries the diamonds around her waist. I'm sure of that. I get it. All right. It's up to you. So long, and good luck, kids. Sure. sure. I'll see you later. I went back to the garage. I hoped I'd get in without the boss seeing me, but old Eagle Eye wouldn't miss anything. Where you been, Johnny? Me? It's out for a cup of coffee. Oh, did you have to get out of your coveralls for that? Go on, get back on the job. I promised that green convertible for tomorrow morning. Now, don't worry about it. I've only got about another half hour's work on it. I'll finish it up. Okay, let me know when it's done. Sure, sure, you'll know when it's done. <laughs> Five o'clock. Five after five. Ten after five. Fifteen after five. Finally, five thirty. It was done. Everything was done by now. Go home and wait. I have my alibi. I was under a convertible in the garage when it happened. All I had to do was make sure the boss saw me leave and what time. I finished that job, Mr. Granger. Ah, oh, that's fine, Johnny. <laughs> of course, you'll be paying me overtime. Got a half hour's overtime coming. Overtime? Like the devil, I will. I didn't ask you to stay overtime. Oh, yeah, but you wanted the job done, didn't you? Well, sure, but not on time and a half. <laughs> it's only a half an hour. Half an hour, no half an hour, no overtime. Okay, okay, have it your way. All right, the next time right. you quit at five like everybody else. Come so on, Johnny. <laughs> I took my time about dinner. It would be some time before the news came through on the radio about the mysterious explosion in the subway. When I reached home, there was a letter waiting for me. I started to shake when I saw the handwriting. It was from Anna. Dear Johnny, I'm sorry I spoke to you the way I did. You had good reason to get angry, and I know you didn't mean what you said. I've been thinking it over, Johnny, and maybe the preacher was right and we should try to make our marriage stick. If you really meant what you said about turning over a new leaf, call me, Johnny. We'll talk about my coming back. I've always loved you, Johnny, in spite of everything, Anna. I, I broke out in a sweat. I, I don't know what I hoped or thought I could grab for the phone. I, I couldn't wait for the news to come through on the radio. I had to know. been killed. But Joyce, what happened to her? Maybe, maybe... Why hadn't it gone off? I had to know that too, so I phoned her home. Hello? Hello. Is, is this Joyce? Jim! Oh, Jim, I was wondering when you called. I waited for you at the St. George and you didn't come. Oh, what, what happened? Oh, I don't know what to say to you, Jim. I, I don't know what you'll think of me. Never mind about that. What happened? What happened? Oh, I had so much time to wait. I sat in the subway until it was time to meet her. And I had the camera right beside me. And, and a man sat down next to me yeah. just as the train was about to leave. Oh, Jim, I should have known. Joyce, what happened? He stole the camera. He picked it up and ran into the train before I could open my mouth. Oh. I didn't know whether to go to the police or not. But I waited for you at the hotel and you didn't come, so I came home. I knew you'd call. You, you didn't tell anyone about it, did you? Oh, no. I, I thought you'd want to take care of it. Okay. Okay, forget it. I'll, I'll take care of it. Just just forget it. You aren't angry, are you, Jimmy? Oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm crazy about you, baby. Forget it. Oh, for once, luck was with me. 
I could thank my lucky stars that there was one chink in the plan. Something I never could have foreseen. All I thought about now was Anna. To call Anna, to arrange to meet her and start my life all over again. I felt like somebody must feel when he gets an 11th hour reprieve. I took a shower and was sitting there in my new robe, smoking a cigarette and feeling like a million dollars. Who is it? Brody, homicide. Huh? What did you say? I said Brody, homicide. What do you want? About a guy who was killed today, a pickpocket and sneak thief named Mickey Rafferty. You know him? How should I know him? Yeah, yeah, something in that. How should you know him? I guess you didn't want to kill him, did you? I didn't want to kill anybody. I, I don't know what you're talking about. You... Where were you at 5 o'clock? Working, working. I was at the Nemo garage. Why? I see. Who were you trying to kill, punk? Come on, come on, talk. Why did you make that nice little bomb? I did that. I didn't make any bomb. I don't know a thing about any bomb. Okay, maybe this will refresh your memory. What is it? Well, look at it. It's a sales slip. Sold to John Lawrence, 185 East 45th Street, one robe, $19.50, deliver. I guess it's that uh, pretty one you're wearing now, huh? Where did you get that sales ticket? It was between two sheets of wrapping paper on that uh, homemade bomb you fixed up. Made it very easy for us, bud. All we had to do was to deliver the package again. And uh, this time it's got a new suit for you, Johnny. <laughs> a nice suit with stripes. Well, uh, I could have weaseled out of it, maybe. But Joyce testified against me. She was sore when she heard about what that X-ray camera really was that she'd been carrying around. Anna's mad, too. Uh, I guess that's natural. That's the way people are. Oh, it certainly is lonely here without dames. You'd think one of them would forget her grudge and come up and see a guy that's only got a few more weeks. <laughs> Ben. The X-Ray Camera, starring Dennis O'Keefe, brought to you by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. This is Truman Bradley. If you have never tasted Roma Wines, you probably wonder why Roma Wines do taste better. Well, I'd like to explain. It's because Roma selects and presses only the choicest California grapes. Then, with ancient skills and unmatched winemaking resources, Roma guides this great treasure patiently, unhurriedly, to rich taste perfection. These fine Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines to await later selection from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines for your enjoyment. These October stay-at-home nights are just perfect for enjoying the better taste of a mellow Roma California wine such as flame-bright Roma Toque or mellow Roma Muscatel with family and drop-in friends. Roma is so inexpensive, too, you'll want to serve Roma often. So keep Roma on hand and be sure to insist on Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. Dennis O'Keefe may soon be seen in the Seymour Nebenzal production, Atlantis. Tonight's suspense play was by George and Gertrude Fass. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss June Havoc as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present Radio's Henry Morgan, Lucille Ball, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Suspense. Tonight, Suspense brings you Miss June Havoc as star. But first, may we remind you that... In America's smartest homes and clubs, where fine wines are truly appreciated and enjoyed regularly, the choice is C-R-E-S-T-A, B-L-A-N-C-A, Cresta Blanca, Cresta Blanca. From the finest of the vines come Cresta Blanca California wines, patiently created to please the knowing tongue. Let the proudest name in wine, Cresta Blanca, enrich your daily living. Add luster to your hospitality. Pour Cresta Blanca souvenir sherry or port or any Cresta Blanca wine. There's one for every occasion, for every taste. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring June Habit in Subway. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. The subway always gets to me. I have to stand back from the edge of the platform when a train is coming in because... Well, heights don't bother me or closed in places... Or any of those other things that give some people the willies? No. No, with me, it's the subway. The shining tracks and the train roaring in out of the black. And I always make myself stand way back when I'm waiting. That's how it started that night. I instinctively drew back when I saw the gleaming white headlight appear in the tunnel, rushing toward me out of the dark. I made myself draw back. But what I really wanted to do was to throw myself in front of that train. The lights on the shining rails hypnotized me like the gleaming eyes of a snake. I stepped backwards in a panic, but that mob, that five o'clock mob poured in behind me and shoved and pulled me with it. I've been pushed around all day, and I, I had this awful cold, and I hated everybody. That's a terrible thing to say, I guess, but that's the way I felt, like committing murder. Oh, I was so tired, so worn out, my feet felt glued to my shoes. And of all the people in the world I didn't want to see, wouldn't that just have to be the night I was shoved right next to Ruth Carney? Paula Stephen! Where have you been keeping yourself? I haven't seen you since the Academy. Hello, Ruth. My favorite actress. What are you doing these days? Oh, nothing. I, I worked in a drugstore for a while. Drugstore? I... You haven't deserted the theater, have you? I'm afraid I have. You, with all your talents. Ruth, I can't seem to find anything. But you, of all of us, well, you can't give up. You were so intense about it. Did you try some of the Try? Oh, I tried to get on all right, but... Yes, but... I know. I had to pay for the privilege of appearing in the summer theater. I did the Westport season. Prentice, you know. Oh, it was wonderful fun. And it's well worth it to me to be able to say I'd had professional experience. Well, that's fine. If you can afford it. Oh, it's awful the way you have to have money for everything these days. Yes, it is. Oh, don't, don't get too close to me, Ruth. I have the most awful sore throat. I just... And if you don't have money, you have to have Paul, don't you? Oh, and speaking of Paul, have you heard about me? No, I haven't. I'm general understudy for Night Laughter. The producer. John C. Rittner? Yes. Yes, he was an old friend of Dad. He used to come over to dinner when I was little. I'd hear them talk about the theater, and I thought there'd be nothing in the world like being an actress. Such fun. All that glamour and all the sensational parties and everybody's Such gay. Such fun. And the press oh, Not the acting. Not the thrill of working at something you wanted to do so much that not doing it makes you not want to live. No. Oh, no. It's such fun. And parties. Wearing expensive suits like the one she had on. Ruth chattered on and I looked at her. The subway stopped. More people got on. Still more and more. Seemed as though they'd never stopped getting on. Someone would grab the doors and hold them open and they kept trying to close them. A fat man chewing a horrible cold cigar stub pushed me still closer to Ruth and... I'm sorry. I, I jumped. 
as something sharp stuck into my side. I was puzzled for a moment, and then I remembered the scissors Mother had asked me to get for her. They were very sharp, and they'd ruined my purse. But it didn't make any difference. It was old, like everything else I had. I closed my hand over the scissors, and I held them tightly so they wouldn't do any more damage. And then, I don't know why, I found myself staring at Ruth's hat. It was so smart, so expensive, so everything that mine wasn't. I found myself hating Ruth's hat. Well, as I was saying, after Dad died, Mr. Ritner stopped coming over so often. So when I got bored with the Academy, I hopped right down to his office and I said, Mr. Ritner, do you remember Henry Connie? Well, I'm his daughter, Ruth. I want to be an actress. Of course, I don't expect big parts right away, but maybe if I could get a walk on or something. Oh, imagine my nerve, Paula. <laughs> Saying that to a big producer like John C. Rissner. But anyway, that's what I did. And you know what he said to me? No. No, what did he say to He me? said, Ruth, I admire your spunk. And if you're half as good an actress as your father was a set designer, you'll be all right. And he hired me, just like that. And your general understudy. That's me. <laughs> but no one's ever been sick. Confidentially, I'm glad. You're glad? Oh, yes. You see, I've never gotten up in any of the parts like I'm supposed to. If I ever had to go on, actually go on, oh, I tell you, I get away with murder. Murder? I couldn't look at her face. I didn't even want to look at any of the passengers' faces. And when I raised my eyes, I saw still more faces simpering down at me from advertisements overhead. I hated everybody and everything. I turned and looked outside the windows. The wet, slimy darkness was roaring past like black death. One faulty switch, one obstruction on the tracks could bring it crashing in on all of us. And who would be the losers? Not Ruth with her silly chatter. Not these other passengers with their tired, blank faces. And not me. Oh, certainly not me. My own tired, blank face was reflected in the window pane, gray and thin. And it didn't seem out of place shimmering in that air of black death just outside. Mr. Ritter's a wonderful man, really, Paula. You should meet him. Matter of fact, well, I hadn't meant to tell you this. I didn't want to build your hopes up, but I told him about you. About me? Yes. You know, I always did think you had loads of talent. So I told him one day, I told him, Mr. Ritner, if anything ever happens to me, I mean, uh, should you decide to give me a real part in your new show, I don't worry about who'll general understudy night laughter. I know just the girl. Paula Stevens. Who? You told him that? Yes. And if the time ever comes and I have to leave, well, he knows your name and everything. Uh, but don't build up your hopes, honey. He hasn't a part for me in the new show. Oh. And as far as anything happening to make me quit, well, there isn't the slightest chance. Hatred welled up so in me that my throat burned like fire. And the fat man with that cigar was leaning against me, and I lashed out like a drowning person. Hey, watch it, lady, watch it. I, I took it out on him. Who I really wanted to knock out of my way was Ruth. Ruth standing between me and the break I'd dreamed of. Understudy in a hit show. But she had said, Well, don't build up your hopes, honey. There isn't the slightest chance. But wasn't there the slightest chance? I thought the slightest chance of something happening to her. The train started up again. It showed me so that I was thrown sickeningly against Ruth. My fingers were testing the points of the scissors in my bag. No one could see me. We were packed in too solidly. The scissors were sharp and cold and long. Yes, they seemed long enough. I kept my eyes on the dim lights and dirty concrete and tiles of the station we sped through as the train throbbed along uptown. I was holding the scissors as though they were a weapon. I was suddenly sure that at some time or another, scissors had been used as a weapon. The scissors in my bag seemed to grow bigger with an idea. Idea and scissors. Scissors and idea. They were increasing in size. The ache in my throat had gone up into my ears, too. Throbbing. 
keeping time with the throbbing of the subway. I looked away from the blackness outside and stared up at the white light of the ceiling. The electric fan overhead was suspended like... like a spider. Suspended like a spider. Like the spider that was spinning. No, no, not, not spinning as a spider should spin, but whirling. Yes, that, that was it, whirling. Like my brain was whirling. <laughs> uh, Ruth? Yes? Uh, you play on Sundays, don't you? Oh, yeah. No show tonight, then. Ruth, why don't you come home and eat with me? There's just Mother and me. We'll be all alone. Oh, I'd love to, Paula. Frankly, I didn't have anything to look forward to but a boring evening. I'm glad now I couldn't find a taxi. Well, Mother will be very glad to see you. Oh, it's very sweet of you to ask me. I haven't had a home-cooked meal in a long time. A casual invitation after a casual meeting. No one knew that Ruth was coming to my house for dinner. Ruth didn't even know where I lived. Get her off the subway a few stations early. Many empty lots up this way. Then one thrust of these sharp scissors. Ordinary scissors. Brand new scissors. And a body in an empty lot. And after a few days, after the funeral... A humble application to Mr. John C. Rittner for my girlfriend's job. He'd remember I'd been recommended by Ruth herself. Oh, and I'll show them. I'll know every line perfectly. And one night the star will not go on. No, I'll go on. That will be it. The noise outside didn't seem like the roar of the subway anymore. It was like tremendous applause. Applause for me. Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you June Havoc in Subway. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, better tasting Roma Wines from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Tomorrow night is Halloween. And that will be the time for gay parties and friendly get-togethers. Now, here's a wonderful yet inexpensive way to make these occasions truly delightful. Simply set out some fruit, cheese, and nuts and serve delicious Roma California wine. In less time than it takes to tell, you're enjoying a delightful party. Yes, any occasion takes on a gala note when better-tasting Roma wines are served. So brighten your party with tempting nut-like Roma sherry Fruity, full-bodied Roma Port, or smooth, mellow Roma Muscatel or Tokay. As you savor the mellow perfection of these fine Roma wines, you'll understand why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. So for smart, low-cost hospitality, or for an everyday family treat, serve better-tasting Roma wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage June Havoc, starring as Paula Stevens, with Lorene Tuttle as Ruth in Subway, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. Some station, 116th Street, I guess it was. I remember I studied Ruth with new, cold interest. I was certainly stronger than she. She wouldn't be expecting anything. Besides, she wouldn't know how to struggle. Things had always come easily to her. She was so wrapped up in her own affairs, she just chattered away. Oh, it's been the most fun getting those checks every week and never having to lift a finger to earn them. <laughs> if they ever catch up with me... The breaks go to girls like Ruth who think that being an actress is great fun. And others, others who really, truly love the theater, they never get a chance. There's no way for them to make their own breaks, not very often anyway. But I had a way in my purse that night. I could get Ruth's job. It belonged to an actress, not her. It belonged to me. To me. Oh, uh, we get the local 
here. We're, we're coming in now. We pushed and elbowed and jostled our way out of the car. We were the last ones out. So we had to turn around and face the tracks with a solid mob at our back. It made me nervous. I hated to stand so near the edge. But there was no way to get to the middle of the platform without bullying my way through. And I... I didn't want to have to explain to Ruth how I felt. But I managed to get my feet placed an inch or so in back of her as we stood wedged in the crowd. That made me feel a little better. Ruth between me and the tracks. Ruth between me and my destiny. Ruth. Always in the way. Just a little push, I thought. Maybe it would be easier. A little push just before our train came in and... Paula! Look at that man over there. Doesn't he remind you of Bill? Well, well oh, yes. Yes, he does. Uh, how is Bill, by the way? Oh, Bill's fine. You still going with him? Uh-huh, yes. Oh, he's a wonderful guy, that Bill. I remember one time... I remembered, too. I remembered how Ruth had tried to take Bill away from me once. She'd done everything in her power. And there for a while, I, I thought she was going to succeed, too. But she hadn't. He was too nice. He wasn't the type to care if a girl couldn't dress in the latest styles and if she didn't have the smartest hats. I knew him first, you know. Yes, I know you did. He used to date me before he knew you. He was just a kid, of course, and I got interested in another boy. But believe me, when I ran into Bill about a year ago, I couldn't help thinking that maybe I'd made a mistake in giving him up so easily. You didn't give him up too easily. Oh, yes, I did. Much easier than I would now if I had it to do all over again. <laughs> You're very serious about him, aren't you? Yes, very. You take everything pretty seriously, don't you, Paula? Ruth was standing on the edge. And she wasn't laughing anymore. She was staring at me in a very peculiar way. She moved around in back of me. And now, I was on the edge. In spite of myself, I looked down at the gleaming rails. Two long silver ribbons pointing toward the black hole where the platform broke off and the walls closed in. And the train was approaching. I watched the tracks, fascinated. I waited for the hypnotic gleam of the headlights to make the rails sparkle and shine and beckon to me. And then the headlights beamed at me out of the void. At me, at me. It was a great warm spotlight. And I swayed over the edge to meet it. And I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> The train was in and out. I was shaking. Ruth's arms were around me, holding me tight. She pulled me back just before I might have... Would have... I should have jumped. What's the matter, Bola? You nearly fell right in front of that train. Are you ill? No. No, I'm... I'm just dizzy. I'm all right now. Thanks for holding me, Ruth. I, I don't think I really would have fallen, though. Come on, let's, let's get in the car. It looks like you were weak or something. You could do with some food. I'll bet you didn't have lunch. No, I didn't. I forgot. But we'll be home soon. I'm starved myself. I'll certainly be glad to get to your place. Oh, I hated her worse than ever. What right did she have to pull me back if I wanted to jump? What business is of hers? Oh, I felt. I felt the scissors in my purse. I wrapped my handkerchief around the handle. No fingerprints, no clues, no motive. Nothing that would be connected with me. A friend that hadn't seen her in ages. And what motive could I have? All I wanted was a job, and nobody would ever think that I had committed murder to get a job. People just didn't do things like that. Not unless they were desperate and bitter with nothing to lose. I think we can grab a couple of seats in a minute. Those two men are getting off. Wouldn't you think they'd have offered them to us in the first place? Really, men in New York. <laughs> I followed her lead and we got the seat. And I sat down very carefully. <sighs> like an old woman. I hadn't sat down all day. Just walked from one office to another. Oh, the muscles in my back and legs ached. I had to sit in an upright position. 
The long blood came rushing upward as I lifted first one foot and then the other gingerly off the floor. The arches ached with relief. And my head swam. I was so grateful just to be able to sit. Oh, grateful. To think that the simple act of sitting down could mean so much to me. Paula Stevens, the most promising actress at the Academy a few years ago. Now nobody would even give me a walk on I turned and I stared at Ruth. I thought, maybe I won't wait for the empty lot. Paula, what's the matter with you? Here we are sitting down and comfortable and you're frowning like a bear with a sore tooth. What are you frowning about? I looked around desperately for something I could be frowning at. A man across the aisle was reading a newspaper and I, I saw a headline. That could be making me frown. I, I indicated it. Oh, you mean the headline? Yes. Um, hit and run driver kills child. Oh, that is nasty. Yes. Makes me sick to see things like that. I never read them. Does it affect you that way? Yes, lowest form of humanity. And suddenly the train shot out of the underground under the trestle, out of darkness into the twilight of a tenement street. The moment before, nothing could be seen through the dirty car windows but the reflection of your own drawn face. But then the ramshackle apartment buildings flashed by outside, showing intimate glimpses of bare kitchens and dim bedrooms, gray wash and cheap living rooms, families going through the functions of living, poor families, tragic living, from the blackness of the tunnel to the twilight of poverty, from death to life, first death and then life, kept pace with the subway, not life, then death, but death to life. Death brings another kind of life. Not necessarily sordid life like this, but new life. Death makes room for somebody else to live. One death for another life. Ruth's death for my new life. You know, I've been thinking about that headline, too. I mean, the one about the hit-and-run driver. I suppose they do get panicky. No, they're still the lost form of humanity. Still and all, I think I can understand how it could happen to anybody. You're driving along, maybe thinking of something else, maybe going a little too fast. You know what I mean. You're just anxious to get someplace in a hurry, and you aren't watching what's ahead. And all of a sudden, bingo, you hit something. Does that mean you shouldn't stop and... and... Well, you don't know what you hit. Oh. Maybe it's just an old friend or a pile of junk. It isn't necessarily a kid or a dog, even. You just don't know. And if you stop and look, you may find you're a murderer. Yes, but if you keep on, you can tell yourself it was just an old piece of junk and go on your way. Now, I can understand a hit-and-run driver. Yes, I can. Oh, why was she raving about a hit-and-run driver? She wore the subject ragged. Well, I thought anyway it won't be much longer now. I won't have to listen to her much longer anyway. One more station and we'd get out. She wouldn't know it wasn't my station yet. And then we'd walk over by the lot. Cut across it in the dark. A scissors. One hard plunge. And back to the subway for the rest of my ride. Alone. Why, I wouldn't even be late for supper. Subway emptied a little. Seemed to be flying through the night, carrying me on dark wings toward my first chance at being something. We were going awfully fast. Too fast. You, you know what I mean? You're anxious to get someplace, and bingo, you something. A pile of junk. It, it has to be junk. A- an obstruction to be cleared away for something more important passing by. But if I should stop and look, it's a girl. Like me. But it's a girl dead in an empty lot. This was our station. This was it. Did we get out here, Paula? I was looking at her roof. An obstruction in my path. I had stopped and I had looked at her. What's the matter, Paula? I thought this was it. Don't we get out here? I had stopped to look. And I had seen that she was a girl. A human being. Paula? You said we were supposed to get off here. Yes. Yes, Ruth. Yes. The train started away without us. Somehow it seemed to run more smoothly. 
as though its wings were light instead of dark. And I was strangely rested. My mind was blank, and I rolled the blankness around, and I tasted it. I swallowed, and, and my mouth and my throat, it felt better. Balls of yesterday's newspapers scurried off the platform and flattened themselves in the corners, and... I'll be glad to get there. Oh, yes. I'm starved. Ruth was a girl. She was a human being. Everybody on that subway was an individual human being. And I had to drive according to the rules. I couldn't hit and run. How could I have ever thought that I could? If I had to get there the hard way, well, I could take it. This way, Paula? Yes. Yes, this way, Ruth. Into the light. I climbed the ramp to the street exit with a new bounce in my feet. I felt in my purse, only to wrap my handkerchief carefully around the scissor point, not the handle. I couldn't afford to completely ruin my already damaged bag. And Ruth was chattering again. Soon we'd be home. And as she chattered, I thought, Ruth's older than I, but she seems like a child. She'll probably never grow up. But I did. That night, arm in arm with Ruth, we walked past an empty lot. And I never even thought of looking back. Suspense. Subway, starring June Havoc, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better tasting wines enjoyed by more Americans than any other wines. This is Truman Bradley, reminding you that when you enjoy Roma California wines, you enjoy the goodness of natural juices pressed from choice, full, ripe California grapes. Then, with ancient skills and the world's greatest winemaking resources... Roma Master Vintners guide this grape treasure unhurriedly to tempting taste perfection. These better tasting Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines. And from these reserves, the world's greatest reserves of fine wines, Roma later selects for your enjoyment. With another weekend of football and fun coming up, it's a good idea to lay in an assortment of better tasting Roma wines, such as gold and amber Roma sherry, ruby red Roma port, or flame bright Roma Muscatel. Then you'll be sure of pleasing friends and neighbors who drop in, as well as your family. Because these delicious Roma wines, that's R O M A, Roma wines, are America's favorite wines. Tonight's suspense play was by Eileen Douglas Walzer and Mel Dinelli. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear radio's inimitable Henry Morgan as star of Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Suspense. Tonight's Suspense brings you as star Mr. Henry Morgan. Each week you hear Mr. Morgan as prime comedian on his own radio show. Tonight, he appears in a role different from any he's ever played before. But first, we'd like to remind you that... Wherever entertaining is the last word in gracious hospitality, the first name in wines is... C-R-E-S-T-A? B-L-A-N-C-A? Cresta? Blanca. Cresta Blanca. That's Cresta Blanca wines. And for the knowing tongue, Cresta Blanca has created two rare California sherries. Dry Watch, a delightfully pale dry sherry that's the perfect prelude to dining. And Triple Cream, the magnificently mellow sherry that won the gold medal at the California State Fair. Yes, when you pour Cresta Blanca, Dry Watch, and Triple Cream, you and your guests enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. 
Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring Henry Morgan in Dream Song. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. The apartment was one and a half rooms, about enough space to turn around, sleep, and eat in. But it was enough for a bachelor like me, and I felt lucky. I'd had to move out of my last place in sort of a hurry. You know how you get pushed around nowadays. And I had no real right expecting anything even halfway decent to turn up for me so soon. I went about installing myself, which merely means bringing in my old studio couch, an old chair, about three trillion books, a couple of Matisse prints, and my typewriter. And I was all set in a day or two and ready to get down to real work on the book. One evening, I came in after a good dinner and sat down to finish off a sequence. It wasn't writing easy. I felt that I was getting off on a tangent. I was going a million miles away from what I wanted to say, and it annoyed me. It was then that I heard it for the first time. It was coming from the next apartment, and coupled with my bad writing, it was very annoying. I tried to ignore it, but that couldn't be done. I got up and walked around the room a few times. That didn't help any. So I sat down and tried to write again. But I was tough, and the right words came like water from a closed faucet. And then the music stopped, and it was suddenly very peaceful. I felt my mind settle down. I started once more. There, it was going along pretty well now. I was thinking clearly, the phrases were right, the mood was good, the dialogue, and the thing started up again. I yanked the paper out of the machine and tossed it into the wastebasket. I was through for the night. A few nights later, after spending the entire day reading, which is so much more delightful than writing... I decided it was about time to sit down and start pounding it out. It was a beautiful night. It took a lot of willpower to tear myself away from the window. I smoked a couple of cigarettes and decided I'd start work after them. Then smoked a few more and listened to the night noises of the city. After that, I searched my pockets for some more cigarettes, but I didn't have any. So I took a deep breath, reluctantly turned my back on the city, and sat down at my work table. There was a story in the paper that I wanted to keep because it was sort of like the situation I was writing about and I was cutting it out. Then, almost as though it was timed, that canned music started up. Well, that settled my work for the night again, I thought. That fool in the next apartment, whoever he or she might be, was probably planning to serenade himself for hours on end. And yet, strangely enough, I half hoped that the music would go on. It was a very lovely evening and I was looking for the slightest excuse to lounge around. I just started thinking of going for a walk when the music stopped. In the stillness that followed, I could hear steps. And then a door opening and closing, and then a long, long silence. Then I was back at my typewriter, and everything was fine. The words were coming right from my brain to my fingers... And as I wrote, I could see the next line and the next. And then, while I was working, I became conscious of the next door footsteps, and it disturbed me. I sat up, stretched, yawned, looked at my watch. One o'clock in the morning. I hadn't realized it was that late. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mr. Kenyon, the janitor. Uh, Please open the door. What's wrong? But he always come around at one in the morning. Excuse it, please, Mr. Kenyon. Are you I... Charles Kenyon? Of course. What is it? He's from the police station, Mr. Kenyon. Here you are. I'm Sam Fields from this precinct. Can I come in? Come right in. What's this all about? Apartment 4D, Mr. Rhodes. Why Mr. don't ben... you share that? Uh, Kenyon, you've been home all night? Yes, I have. What have you been doing here all night? Mr. Kenyon's a Look, writer. are you going to keep your trap shut? Go ahead, Kenyon. Well, I'm a writer, and I've been working all evening. That's about all. You didn't hear no noise, no commotion? No. What's happened? 
The man in the apartment 4D has been killed, murdered. Oh, the floor is all what? covered with blood. Oh, we'll never get it off without scraping. That'll run up a bill, too. 4D. That's two flights up? Oh, he was a pretty good guy, that Mr. Rodson. But he gave me five for We're Christmas. We're just in here checking up. I don't suppose you knew him. No, I didn't. Well, he must have been killed a short time ago. The coroner's upstairs now. The janitor here heard a struggle and phoned in. Yeah, I live in 4E now. The owner chopped the basement up into three apartments. Or well, he makes a barrel of money that way, Mr. you see. Mr. Rodson and was I, just I... about dead when we got there. I'm surprised you didn't hear us go up. I was uh, busy writing. Yeah, it must have been. Oh, all that blood on the floor. We, we'll never get it off. Why, well, the next tenant will have to paint the floor red, I tell you. Uh, how was he killed? He was stabbed in the back with a sharp and steel. Yeah, yeah he was stabbed in Not the back. Not a knife, the doc says. It could be maybe a shears or scissors. Well, we looked all around, but you couldn't find no scissors. The murderer isn't giving out souvenirs this week. Well, Mr. Kenyon, I guess you're okay. We may want you to come down to headquarters for a few questions tomorrow. If so, I'll let you know. Yes, sir, of course. You can go back to your writing now. <clears throat> Hey, what do you write? Detective stories? No, about, uh, about people. Yeah? <laughs> That's who commits the murders, too, people. Although I must say some of my best friends are people. What'd you write tonight? I don't see nothing around. I, uh, I don't like to have people see it, you know, until it's finished. You know, I got a tenant already for that apartment. Maybe that's why the guy was knocked off, so someone could get the apartment. Uh, what about his wife? Oh, four D's got no wife. Now, I know he's got a young lady, but he is a bachelor. All right, all right, all right. We ain't uh, interested uh, in gossip. Come on, let's go. Oh, I'll right. be seeing you, Mr. Kenyon. Yes. Uh, good night. One night, a week after that, I was lying in bed trying to sleep. I don't know why I couldn't sleep. I've been working hard all day. I was dead tired. My legs felt heavy, but my brain, instead of feeling dull, was sharp and alert. Quite suddenly, and for no reason, I felt waves of chills run along my spine. I sat up in bed, reached for a cigarette. I looked at my watch. 2.20, and I'd wanted to get up at 7. Snuffed out the butt and leaned back. Somehow I seemed a bit more relaxed now. I closed my eyes and felt comfortable, tired out. And then there it was again. That music. And I was wide awake again and tense and jumpy as a cat. I don't know why it made me feel that way, but it did. It went on and on. Sometimes it would seem to be fading away. Then it would be loud again. And then fade away. I crouched beneath the covers and drew the pillow over my head. That was better. I could still hear it, but it wasn't so bad. And it seemed to get farther and farther and farther away. And I was so tired. Exhausted by now. I heard that sort of thump from somewhere upstairs. But it didn't matter now. All I cared about was sleep. Sleep. Just sleep. Uh, oh, Are you all right? Uh, of course I'm all right. Just a minute, I'm still in bed. Can a man sleep around here oh, without people? I didn't know you were sleeping. You always sleep this late, Ken. Oh, Inspector, I didn't recognize you. I guess I'm still a little bleary eyes. Come on in. I ask if you always sleep this late. Twelve? I guess it is late. No, I don't usually, but I couldn't get to sleep last night. Uh, last night, Shut was... up, Kenyon, do you know the guy who lives upstairs? That was Mr. Blackwell, the lawyer. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't know anyone around here. I do my work. That's all I know. Look, you asked me these questions the last time you were here. Yeah, 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 I know, and I'm asking him again. Mr. Blackwell, he's been killed. Killed? Upstairs? Yep, killed the same way. Floor just filled with blood, just like 4D. Well, last night I did hear something. Hmm? I didn't think it was anything then. It was just a sound, like a table or something falling over from upstairs. There was no table falling. What time do you think you heard it? A little while after I went to bed. 
A little after 2 a.m.? No, Mr. Blackville divorced his wife five months ago. She was such a nice woman. The coroner says death took place around that time. You didn't hear anything else, did you? What? I said, did you hear anything else? Anything else? Anything else? That music. But I couldn't tell him about that. I couldn't tell it to a detective. Or that terrible feeling I had when I heard it. It would sound silly, crazy. I yes, could... yes. Did you hear anything else? No. No, I didn't hear anything else. I went to sleep right after that, and I didn't wake up until you rang the bell just now. Mr. Blackwell gave me a ten for Christmas, but he never smiled. He was a very We've sad man. We've been checking up to see if oh. everyone else oh. is all right. Has anyone else? No, 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 no. Just this guy above you. I, I guess we got some sort of maniac operating in this area. Well, he tries to get me. He's going to get a big surprise. I got a license to carry a gun. I got a good gun, too. My son brought it to me from Germany. <laughs> well, now, don't go shooting the tenants just because they don't pay the rent. <laughs> Everybody pays the rent here. Oh, did you ever see a guy with no sense of humor? Well, this whole thing doesn't seem particularly funny. <laughs> well, don't you worry about it, Mr. Kenyon. You've got the whole police force protecting you, so don't worry about it at all. Well, I'll probably be seeing you. So long. So long. Uh, good, uh, goodbye, Mr. Kenyon. Oh, uh, Mr. Torsten, yeah. will you stay a moment? I'd like you to do something for me. Why, uh, sure, sure. Mr. Torsten, you seem to know a good deal about everyone in the building. I don't snoop around. Oh, I'm the janitor. I, I, I just see them I and know, other people I, don't see I them. I know. I, I didn't mean it that way. I just want to ask you a question or two. Oh. Uh, this Mr. Blackwell who was killed, he was living alone, wasn't he? Yeah, like I told you, he was married, but uh, his wife moved out. Do you know it's harder to take blood off the floor than it is from the walls? You can paint the walls, but the floor has to be scraped uh, and sanded. Uh, <laughs> what about my uh, my neighbor to the left next door? Oh, uh, 2E? Well, I don't know too much about him. i just seen him once. He never bothers me. His name is Williams. Has he uh, got a phonograph? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got lots of records for the phonograph, too. I've seen them when they put the telephone in. That was the only time I was ever in his place. I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Torsten. Oh, that's it. Uh... Well, say, thank you, Mr. Kenyon. And if there's ever any time you ever want anything... Don't be afraid to ask. No, I... I won't be afraid. No, I... I won't be afraid. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Henry Morgan in Dream Song. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This is the season when the air is clear and sharp, the kind of weather to whet appetites to razor keenness. Well, here's an easy, inexpensive way to make the plainest food taste like a chef's masterpiece. For family meals or when guests come to dinner... Just serve a delicious Roma California table wine, such as robust Roma Burgundy or delicate pale gold Roma Sautern. You'll be amazed how much these delicious Roma wines add to your mealtime enjoyment. Now, the simplest, most economical meals take on new glamour and flavor goodness. Remember, there's a better tasting Roma wine for every occasion, for every taste. Yet it costs little to enjoy this taste luxury. So always serve Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Henry Morgan, starring as Charles Kenyon, with Wally Mayer as the inspector, and Joseph Kearns as Torsten in Dream Song, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. time in my life, I felt genuinely afraid. Because it was something you couldn't know, couldn't fight. An innocent knock on the door, you open it, the next thing that happens is you're found in a pool of blood. With that intolerable canned music coming from next door. 
I wondered what that Williams looked like living next door. Why should he play that one record over and over again when he had so many? Torsten said that. And I wondered what he sounded like. The house phone. Yes, Mr. Kenyon? Uh, give me Mr. Williams' apartment, too. He... The music started. That meant he was in. And I could find out what he sounds like. Why doesn't he answer? He's there. Maybe he knows I'm calling. Maybe he can hear me call. Shall I keep ringing, sir? Well, why doesn't he... Well, no. Never mind, operator. Never mind. I was certain that Williams had heard me call him on the phone. Had been, as a matter of fact, waiting for me to call... From that day on, I left peace of mind behind. I thought of moving, but there was no place to go. I smoked more and more. I sat for hours in a dark movie in the park in the public library reading room. And still that record revolved in my ears. If only I could get to know who this Williams was. If I could get to see him. If I could get to observe him somehow without his observing me. I was in the park when I thought of it. I could see our windows from the park. I hurried home. I searched in a drawer for my one war souvenir, my German liberated binoculars. Powerful 8 by 50 Zeiss field glasses. There they were, still dusty. I wiped them with my shirt, went back downstairs to survey the terrain. I hurried over to the park, my heart beating like a trip hammer. Leaned against the body of an old auto, trying to look at ease. I looked up at William's window. The Venetian blinds were raised. I looked around, no one in sight. Quickly, I unslung my binoculars, held them up to my eyes. What was I focused on? That wasn't William's window. That was mine. There was a window. To the left? Should be just about there. There it was. The window. Just as though I were a few yards from it. Having fun, buddy? No. Uh, no, officer, I... Uh... See anything good? Uh, look, officer, I... I yeah, think... yeah, I know. You're trying to spot planes. Yeah, trying to spot planes. Why don't you try spotting them from the roof? Well, I, uh, never spotted anything from the roof. Look, wise guy, I'll give you a tip. I'm easy going. But when headquarters gets on my tail, I gotta play rough. Now, if somebody puts in a complaint, and I catch you causing trouble, I'll run you in. You understand? Well, I... Well, so far, there's been no complaint. Now, let's just leave it that way, huh? So just beat it now before I change my mind. For two days after that, the thought of that cop catching me with the binoculars made me tremble. I found my hand shaking when I lit a cigarette. Couldn't eat. I knew that I must find some way to reassure myself about Williams or I'd lose my mind. One morning, after I'd spent a sleepless night listening and watching... The music went on. My plan was to wait till the music stopped. Possibly then, Williams would go out. And as soon as he left, I'd slip out and follow him. I waited while that music ground out. That metallic sediment squeezed out through a loudspeaker. Nine o'clock. Nine thirty. Ten o'clock. 10.30. My head started to go round and round like the record under the needle. 11 o'clock. The music still kept on. And on. And on. (gasps) Suddenly I sat up quickly. Looked at my watch. 3 o'clock. I'd been sleeping. But the record... It was still... Torsten. Torsten, he always talks about blood. Mr. Kenyon? 
Did you say something? Don't you come in here! Don't come in here! Oh, Ken, you what's the matter? You keep away, Thompson. You keep away from it. Keep away? All right, all right. Only I, I was just going to tell you, don't use the incinerator for a while. We're cleaning it out for the next couple of hours. In, uh, incinerator? Yeah. Oh. Well, why tell me? Oh, we tell everybody. We don't keep it no secret. Mr. Williams, too? Well, he pays his rent. Only he's not home. I just knocked, didn't I? Yeah, but you came in here with a key. Why? Because I hear you yell like a bull. I thought maybe something was wrong. Maybe... Maybe something is wrong with Mr. Williams. Why don't you open his door? Look, Mr. Kenyon, I don't go around opening people's doors for, for the fun of it. I got a job to keep. I got a reputation to think of. If you think a super's job is easy, you got it all wrong. I didn't mean it that way. Well, okay. Only, please, don't use the incinerator, huh? Why did William's record stop just before Torsten knocked? Why didn't he answer Torsten's call? He wanted privacy. Privacy to play his record. Every day for the next week, that music played at the strangest hours. It became a personal message to me. I was next. Get ready, Kenyon. You're next to have the floor of your apartment scraped, the walls done over. Many times I thought of calling the police. But what could with that do? No one would believe me just because of a record. No one would believe me without some proof. That was it. Proof, something that would stand up in court before a judge, before a jury. Yeah, but before I could get that, he might creep into this room. Slowly, quietly, while I was asleep, while I was in that bed, helpless as a child. Hour after hour, I walked the streets trying to think, to reason my way out. Yesterday, I sat huddled in a chair all day. The music didn't play at all. About seven o'clock, I went out for something to eat. In the evening paper, there was an item that could be the basis for a good short story. And when I got back, I started to clip it out. And then I got my nerves again. I locked the door. I went to both the windows. I locked one window. Then I went to the other one. Wait a minute. This window was the window with the fire escape. Whose window was that on the other side of the fire escape? It was his window. William's window. I stared at it as though I were hypnotized. The light was on. That meant he was home. Maybe I could... Maybe I could crawl out on the platform, peek in through the window. Maybe I could get a look at him. As I was thinking these thoughts, the music sounded. And I started to sweat. Cold, icy sweat. I started to close the window, but I... I caught myself, and I pushed it back open. With the palms of my hands wet, I climbed up on the window ledge, and I crawled out on the fire escape, and I made my way along the iron bars as silently as I could. And the window was just in front of me, and I felt my throat go dry as I leaned my head over to try to look in. I swallowed hard and tried to keep my body concealed. The Venetian blinds were drawn all the way, but they were slanted in such a way that permitted me to see inside. I craned my head forward and looked. It was dark inside, but I could make out the living room and the photograph, large cabinet machine. There was a couch, and there, there was a man. And it seemed as though he was dancing, swaying to the music, and it kept getting louder. And he kept coming towards me. Nearer and nearer. He must have seen me. And I couldn't move. And he kept coming nearer. Moving in the shadows. Nearer. Nearer. Ah! When I came out of it, I was in my own apartment, lying on my own couch. And Inspector Fields was there and a lot of other people. Ah, uh, he'll be okay now. Did you get him? Did you get him? Yeah, they, they got him. They think. They think? Don't they know? It was Williams. I saw him in his room. He was coming at me. He was going to kill me. I was going to be next. He was coming at me there uh, in the take dark. Take it easy, Kenyon. Take it easy. That wasn't Williams. That was me. Oh. Listen, Inspector... 
There's something I haven't told you. Something I heard. The other two times. Yeah? I thought it would sound crazy, but I heard music. A song. An old song. An old record. Yeah? What was it? It was I'll See You In My Dreams. Heard it again tonight in William's room. He was playing it. Yeah, I guess you heard it tonight, all right. And I heard it the other two times, too. The same way. Same song. Maybe you heard it. Maybe you just thought you heard it. How much do you remember? Do you remember coming at me with those scissors? Scissors? Kenyon, we found your other apartment. The one you moved out of a month ago. My other apartment? Mm Mm-hmm. And we found your wife. I... I don't have a wife. No, but you did. And that song you were talking about, it uh, was on the phonograph. And your wife... She was dead. They made me talk to a doctor today. Hallucinations, he said. Hearing that song that way, I sort of remember Alice. She was playing a record, and I was clipping something out of... Well, I... I don't know what to believe. Because I thought the song was real, and the woman, the dead woman... I thought that was a dream. Just a bad dream. They wouldn't... They wouldn't hang a man for a dream, would they? Starring Henry Morgan, presented by Roma Wines. That's R O M A. Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. This is Truman Bradley to tell you why Roma Wines are America's favorite wines. It's because Roma selects and presses the choicest California grapes. Then, with centuries old skill and wine making resources unmatched in America, Roma guides this grape treasure to tempting perfection. These better-tasting Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines to await later selection for your enjoyment from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This weekend, treat your friends to the better taste of a fine Roma California wine, such as ruby red Roma port, golden amber Roma sherry, or flame bright Roma muscatel. Discover for yourself why Roma wines, that's R-O-M-A, Roma wines are enjoyed by more Americans than any other wines. Tonight's suspense play was by George Bellack and Ben Kerner. Henry Morgan will soon be seen in his first starring picture, the screenplay Enterprise production, So This is New York, and may be heard every Wednesday night on another network for Eversharp Schick. Be sure to listen next Thursday, same time, to Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Anna, this is Johnny. Oh. What do you want? I told you not to bother. Well, now, listen, Anna. I've got to see you. I don't want to see you, Johnny. If I told you once, I told you a hundred times, don't fall. Yes, I know. But now, wait. This is important. I must talk to you, Anna. Just let me talk to you. Oh, Johnny, listen. Now, listen, please. Let me see you for just a few minutes. Saturday night. After that, if you still want me to stay away, I will. I'll never bother you again. That's what you always say. Oh, listen, honey. Won't you just let me talk to you? If it's no go, I'll let you have that divorce. All I want is ten minutes, that's all. You on the level? About the divorce? Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, Johnny. Come over at seven o'clock Saturday. But I might as well tell you now, you're wasting your time. Oh, can't why you... can't you be reasonable about it, Annie? You know, you Save and I can... Save your breath, Johnny. You want to see me? All right, all right, I'll see you. Seven o'clock Saturday. Goodbye. <laughs> It didn't look good. I could feel that all the things I'd saved up to say to her wouldn't work. 
She hated me and she'd never have me back again. There's a stubborn streak in me that wouldn't let me give it up. I figured I'd play it as I'd planned it. Then if she wouldn't change her mind, I'd go through with it to the end. Late Saturday afternoon, I went down to Hooper's department store and sauntered over to the jewelry counter. Yes, sir? I'd like to see a wristwatch. Ladies' wristwatch, please. How much would you like to spend? Oh, I don't know. About uh, 200 or so. Oh, well, here you are. 17 jewel movement, 14 carat white gold case set with 10 small diamonds. Very pretty. And it's reduced from 349 to 225. Say, that's pretty classy. <laughs> Some girl's going to get a mighty nice surprise. Huh? You like it? Like it. I love it. I wish I had a friend who could buy things like that for me. Oh, now you're kidding me. A beautiful girl like you must have plenty of friends. Oh, not anyone I could really call a friend. I see. Uh, this watch. How would you like it if I gave this to you? Just like that, huh? Well, not exactly just like that. First, I'd have to get to know... Suspense. Tonight's suspense brings you our star, Mr. Dennis O'Keefe. But first, do you know that... On the great ship Queen Elizabeth, where travel is the last word in luxury, the first name in wines is... C-R-E-S-T-A? B-L-A-N-C-A? Cresta? Blanca. Cresta Blanca. Yes, the best. Serve Cresta Blanca California wines from the finest of the vines. And whatever the occasion, there's a magnificent Cresta Blanca selection to bring rare pleasure to the most discriminating taste. So, distinguish your diners. Pour Cresta Blanca Burgundy, Cresta Blanca Sauterne, or any Cresta Blanca table wine, and enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now... Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring Dennis O'Keefe in the X-Ray Camera. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. I've been reading a lot here. And I came across something good the other day. There is a shadowy borderland between hate and love. And there are men who dwell in this land of mixed emotions, loving deeply and fiercely, and yet, at the same time, hating venomously and murderously. I guess I both loved and hated my wife. I was crazy for her, lonely and desperate without her. And at the same time, I wish she'd be killed or die somehow so I wouldn't keep depending on her for the affection I'm always so hungry for. Hello. Hello. Hello, Anna. Are you better? <laughs> Not from that side of the county. I know, but you could meet me after you get through with work. I don't leave here till nine. Okay. I could wait until nine. For you. On the 34th Street side. It'll take me about ten minutes to change my clothes. I'll be there. It's a date. Even if you don't buy the watch. Oh, I told you I am buying it. Well, I have to make out a sales slip. Name, please. Hmm? Oh, uh, James Landry. Yeah, yeah, James Landry. <laughs> What's yours? Joyce. Now, see, that'll be 225 plus tax of 20%, making it 270. And uh, sales tax is 450. 270, 450, all told. Your address, please? Oh, you don't need that. It is uh, 270 and 4 and uh, 50 cents. Right? Right. Shall I wrap it? I don't know, just like that. Ten after nine, baby, huh? I'll be there. Yes, the chances were I would be there. I didn't hold out much hope that Anna would listen to me. And if she didn't... Ah, oh, why not? Joyce girl was quite a kid. Tall, slim, terrific guy. Pleasant smile. Sure. Why not? And besides, she'd work right in with the whole thing. She 
She'd work in swell. I had plenty of time before seven in my appointment with my wife, so I wandered through the shop. Even bought myself a new robe. After all, you might want to impress someone. I had the robe sent home, and then I dropped into Patty's clam house. When I finished coffee, it was time to take the BMT to Anna's. I got there just at seven. It was a little awkward at first, but after a while, I got to it. Oh, I tell you, Anna, this last year's just been awful. Oh, you know, I'm still crazy about you, and every hour we're apart just makes me feel worse. Is that all you have to say, Johnny? No, 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 let me finish. I admit I've been a heel, I've... Well, I've done everything wrong. You were perfectly right to leave me. All I can say is I'm sorry and then it won't happen again. Oh, sure. No, Anna, really. I'll turn over a new leaf. You take me back and you'll see. I promise you'll never... You know, Mr. Landry, I was sure you wouldn't show up at 9 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> what made you think that? Well, I thought you were giving me a line. Anyone who buys a watch like that must have a girl. Well, I still have it in my pocket. Gosh, then you weren't kidding why should I kid you, sister? You're too pretty to kid. But you can't mean you're going to give it to me. Sure. Why not? If I feel like it. What business are you in? You're not a, a racketeer, are you? <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm, uh, I'm on the other side of the fence. What do you mean? I'm a private eye. A private eye? Oh, gosh, this is thrilling. Imagine me knowing a real detective. <laughs> well, just keep it under your hat. It, it doesn't do for people to know my business, you know. Makes it harder to tailor crook. Oh, you must have so many exciting things happening to you. No, it's all in the day's work. Are you working on a case now? Are you, are you trying to solve a murder? No. I'm trying to get the goods on a jewel thief. Really? Yeah. This gal, uh, she works for a big diamond-cutting firm. The firm hired me. And she's been stealing diamonds? We think so. Well, then why don't you arrest her? My goodness, if someone is stealing diamonds... Well, you just... can't just haul her in. You've got to get the goods on her first. Well, I should think that would be easy. To search her. Mm. We arrest her and find nothing, and we can get sued for false arrest. Even if she's a crook? True, true. You've got to have the proof first. And I'm out to get it. How? Can I trust you not to talk? Why, Mr. Landry, you know you can. Jim. Oh, sure, Jim. But tell me about it. Well, you see, there are a lot of things in detective work that crooks don't know about. Mm -hmm. For example, and this is a secret, remember, we have an X-ray camera. An X-ray camera? What for? Well, suppose we want to see if someone has something hidden in his clothes, you know, a gun or something. Oh, my goodness. Take a picture with this X-ray camera, we know. And then you can use that camera to tell if this woman has the stolen diamonds on her, huh? Sure. Sure, only I, uh, I can't do it. Why not? I can't get close enough to her. She knows me. Every time she sees me, she ducks. Oh. You see, you've got to stand real close with that camera, else it doesn't register. Well, then why don't you hire someone to take the picture? Someone she doesn't know. You can't trust anybody. This camera is so secret that you can't let a stranger handle it. Well, get someone you can't. never have any reason to complain. Johnny, you know it'll never work out. Oh, but it will. You've given me your word dozens of times, and always it's the same. I, I, I just can't take that sort of thing anymore. But I can't. You can't be happy living alone like this in a furnished room, eating out. I still have the apartment. If you come back, you don't have to work either. I've got a swell job now. I'm head mechanic at a big garage. Oh, but things can be a lot better than before. We'll have more money. Johnny, I'm not thinking of the money. I make enough to get by. Then why not try? I just want my peace of mind, oh, Johnny. Oh, Anna. It hasn't been so bad this last year. At least I don't have to be worrying about where you are nights. If you want to chase the girls, oh, it's no, not my wait concern a minute. anymore. Not... No, if we get together again, I'll have it all over again. Sitting up and wondering and hating it and hating oh. you and hating myself. No, no, Johnny. No, not anymore. Oh, but there won't be any more of that. I swear no, it. No, not until the next time. Oh, yeah. gee, Anna. Why don't you believe me? Oh. oh, I know I lied about it before, but not this time. It means too much to me this time. I've got to have you back. Look. Look, honey, I brought you something. Just to show you I do mean it. A watch. Very nice. Well, put it on, Anna. Go ahead. Wear it. That won't do, Johnny. That isn't enough. It's not nearly enough to convince me you're really any different. What more can I say? Nothing, nothing. Just forget it, Johnny. Just let me get a divorce and forget all about it. You, you, you'll find someone else. Is that why you want a divorce? So you can find someone else? Well, there isn't anyone just now, but I don't see why there shouldn't well, be. Well, I won't do it. I'll never give you a divorce. Oh. You're my wife, and you're going to stay my wife. Like the preacher said, till death do his part. Well, the preacher was wrong, Johnny. I'm saving my money. When I have enough, I'll get it. You can't keep me tied to you all my There's life. There's only one thing that'll break up our marriage, and that's you are dying. You better go, Johnny. I don't like this kind of talk. Well, I'm warning you, Anna. If you don't come back, I'll... 
I'll kill you. Oh, Johnny, you're bluffing. You can't kill a fly, oh, not I'm bluffing, you. Huh? You're too scared. And besides, the first one the cops had looked for would be you. They know all about your threats, Johnny. You don't scare me any more than you ever did. Now, oh, you better go, please. This time I'm not bluffing. Wait a minute. Here's your watch, Johnny. Take it back to the store and get your money. Give it to that little redhead. You're still seeing her, aren't you, Johnny? Oh, you think I'm bluffing, huh? Well, you'll see. You'll see if I'm bluffing or not. 